Welcome to PhD with Women on It, Hug the Future. My name is Beata Young and today's PhD Positivity Hug delivered will be by our guest, Azadeh Williams. Topic, how to sell your captivating story to boost your startup exposure. Episode 91 starts here. Let me remind you, this is a grassroots community that focuses on women on IT, an inclusive forum of women in technology, startups, and female leaders who are supported by men as well. And I bring empathy to this hustle because empathy is my mojo and empathy is critical when you are captivating, building a captivating story to boost your startup exposure. Tech companies often don't know how to do storytelling right. Some might think they, all they need is a good idea or they might think that their product or service is amazing enough that they don't need to tell a story. But it doesn't work that way. Most technology companies struggle to articulate what business problems they actually solve while making it simple enough for non-technical people to grasp. Articulating your message well is an effective way to get noticed by potential customers and to create brand awareness, which is important for any business. This is where marketing, PR, and multimedia enters. And our PhD 91 guest, Azdan Williams, Managing Director uh, of IZK Media, is just the right person to provide insights in this scope. With over 20 years global experience in media, marketing, and PR, Azdan is passionate about helping B2B companies expand into new and emerging markets. She has produced over 8,000 new stories, research, insights, PR, and marketing campaigns globally as a former solicitor, lecturer, and international journalist. She has been consistently recognized as BNT Women in Media and Women Leading Technology Leaders for Marketing, Public Relations, and Entrepreneurship, and awarded the best of the best in PR for Australia, Australia, Asia in 2021. Time to bring another great episode from the future. Not only from the future, because we are in completely different time zones. I'm tuning from Valletta, but actually you're gonna listen to us and watch us next week. As then, let's start with a simple question. Where in the world are you? And what time is it now with you? So um, our headquarters are in Sydney, Australia. Our office is at beautiful, sunny Manly Beach. And it is now a quarter to eight in the evening. So well, it's, it's qu quarter to 10 in uh, Valletta, in the beautiful Mediterranean island of Malta. And actually, there was lots of Maltese living in Australia, isn't there? That's right. Yes, Australia is so beautifully multicultural. It's a, a lovely melting pot of lots of different nationalities. Mm. And speaking of different nationalities, you were born and raised in Australia or where is your name coming from? Because it's very oriental. Yeah, so my uh, background, so my parents are uh, Persian by origin, but uh, I grew up in Australia all my life, so very much Australianized um, school, education, family, everyone's here. That gives you probably the broader perspective and different mindset of being raised by a family with different backgrounds than everybody else. How was it raising in, in Australia? Well, that's a very interesting question. So um, back in the 80s, Australia wasn't very multiculturally diverse, especially uh, in Sydney where I was raised. Um, it was very monocultural. And um, let's just say that it was it was tough growing up, you know, being the only dark-haired child at school where everyone else was blonde and, you know, um, very, very different um, culturally. So it was, it was quite challenging at, at that time. But I think um, Australia has really evolved since then. And now that my daughter is going to school, 
um, and she's half half British, half Persian, and born in Australia. So you see this beautiful evolution now um, happening with uh, with everyone um, bringing all their different perspectives to um, to the Australian culture. Uh, that also helps to boost startup scene. Tell us about the startup scene in Australia where you live. Yeah, so Australia is going through a really interesting time now. I mean, we're seeing a lot of um, funding by the government, um, New South Wales government, federal funding, um, uh, Victoria as well. Some of the larger um, innovation hubs around Australia are really growing. There's a huge tech renaissance happening up in Queensland and Brisbane. So there's a real shift towards um more innovation, startup thinking, a lot of venture capital activity happening. Um, it's, it's actually a really exciting time to explore um, getting your startup off the ground in the region. Uh, so what inspired you or what attracted you to go into startup space? So uh, we uh, deal not only just in the startup space, but, um, you know, from companies that have been around for one or two years to those that have been around for four or five, um, two billion valuation, but they still consider themselves startups. So the word startup now is very broad. Um, so a, a lot of uh, what we do is when um, – organizations get to a certain level of success in their region, especially sort of uh, US technology vendors or those in Europe, when they get to a certain level of growth and they want to expand in new regions um, like the APAC region or UK and EMEA, that's where we come in and, and help them grow. Um, and uh, in many ways, when they do start growing in new regions, they do have that really interesting startup mindset because they're pretty much starting from scratch. Nobody knows, knows who they are in these new regions. Um, their customers are still unsure of what they do. They've only got very small capability and they're quite lean, their teams are quite lean on the ground. Um, and for us, that's really exciting because we're really helping, um, especially great innovative companies that we really feel solve complex business problems to really get them noticed and um, and help them grow in these new regions. And, and it's really exciting to see them go from being totally unknown to everybody knowing who they are. Oh, absolutely. So that's where the startup story comes in. And um, this is the topic of our discussion. It's really important to get your story right. Tell us, what are the most common mistakes startups make when they put their story across? So uh, a couple of things that um, is, a, is a common mistake, and this is just going from not as a PR agency lead, but as a former um, journalist who was pitched hundreds of these media pitches from startups every day, um, is just being too promotional. Um, you know, storytelling, getting getting your name, your brand story out there in an authentic way um, is really not about selling uh, and just, just about the product. My product has X and Y features and um, you can purchase it here and here is a demo. It's not just about that. It's about what are the complex business problems that are timely now? How do you solve them? And how do you solve them better than your competitors? And how do you then articulate that in a way that's not too technical, easy for anybody to understand? Um, a lot of journalists are not necessarily technology um, technologists or coders by background. They've often studied media and communications, um, arts. They don't necessarily have a really deep intel into the complexities of a particular um, platform. So if, you're, if your story is too technical, and too hard to un understand, um, it's just not going to resonate. Whereas if you make your um, if you make your brand story very palatable, easily digestible, relatable, um, it can really help uh, not only resonate with your um, with with the press, but also with prospects who can quickly, in a snapshot, just understand what you're about and uh, and why, as as founders as well, why you're particularly passionate about solving that particular problem out there with your platform solution. 
Uh, you speak with a passion, and I have to say, one question that I have always with these startups, how much of their story is a real story? How much of it is a real story? <laughs> <laughs> because it almost sounds like you're trying to sell something and you have to make up something to make it palatable, relatable, and as you beautifully put it, uh, digestible. Well, it's not just, it's not about making things up or fabricating. It's about just breaking things down in a simple, easy to understand uh, way. You know, we, we, we talk about AI, we talk about um, business intelligence or data and analytics or MarTech solutions, and there's a lot of jargon. So instead of talking through about, you know, getting the things across with all these sort of technical jargon words, why don't we just use normal language <laughs> so that everyone can understand it? So it's not about, you know, making up unicorns and fairies. It's just about speaking in a way that more people can understand. Absolutely. You're trying to appeal to the market, not necessarily to other technologists. Uh, so other than, other than one question that I have, uh, which is a very, very difficult subject for many startups, how to make that story not only complex, Telling, but also how to write to journalists to make it stand out from all the stories, all the pictures they receive. Um, so, well, how to do it? Just come to us and we can help you. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much what we do. Um, I think before you even uh, start putting together a, 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 a media campaign or a press release or any sort of story, Start by really understanding the foundations again, like what I mentioned. What are the business problems that you solve that are critical and timely? What's newsworthy about it? How does your how does your platform solve those problems? If you can just articulate that, just in, even in bullet points, then you can be, they can you can translate that into a wider story that's easily understandable and has that urgency factor that um, that that can be picked up by media. So really the job of um, a, a publication, a news publication, is to publish news, newsworthy items. So if you can showcase that what you do and how you solve it is really newsworthy and groundbreaking and innovative, you've got a great story to tell. Um, usually what we find is that companies that have a genuine innovation that is truly groundbreaking and revolutionary, the, the story sells itself. Um, you know, there's, there's no point taking a mediocre product that's not quite ready for market, um, that still has the bugs in it, that no one's quite confident in, and, and try and big it up because it's just it just doesn't work. Um, but if you really can show that there's an innovative story in there, um, and if you have a use case, if you have a customer that already is using the uh, solution and has results and can, you can add their story into the mix, that will give you that extra um, power. So, so one thing you can start off with is those, those things and then dovetail in a customer that can advocate um, what you're about. So finding your brand ambassadors is the way um, definitely much easier, right? Um, now, um, I can't help but think about um, some of the fakers in the startup uh, industry. Uh, have you met some of them and uh, can you actually spot those? Yes. So for our agency, um, as an example, is we do a lot of due diligence before we onboard a client. Um, we need to be genuinely passionate about their product. Uh, we actually request a demo before starting an engagement to actually look at the platform, its capabilities. Um, a, a lot of what we find uh, is... Um, We'll have a product that's a really great market fit for, say, the US, but say it's a data data uh, analytics product that's great for the US, but for some reason it just doesn't translate in, uh, and it's not a good market fit for um, Australia. The, there's not enough customer base for it to work. Um, there, there could be tighter data privacy rules or regulations here where the platform just is just not the right market fit or the pricing is completely wrong. So um, in that sense... How do we put it? You can't, um, you know, you can't really uh, 
promotes something that's just not going to work, no matter how much you big it up, no matter how much you put the bells and whistles on it, if it's not the market fit, there's, there's, you're just wasting your time and, and money. And, um, and what we normally do is have a full frank conversation with clients where we do really do feel like their product isn't the right fit. And, and we let them know that it's, it's best to reconsider expanding in particular regions or perhaps redirecting their product in a different uh, vertical or focus. So you're not only offering the PR marketing uh, strategy, but also you are an advisor um, on a, um, to, to the startup. Absolutely, yes, because um, the last thing we and I think the last thing we want to do is promote um, promote a particular technology solution that um, that isn't actually working in in the region that we're promoting in. Um, that actually impacts our relationship. With the media because you know we need to have a trustworthy relationship with media that they know that when we pitch stories and when we're working on behalf of clients they, they're genuinely great um, ethical um, and um, and powerful successful leaders in their field uh, and so we need to we, we need to be have that accountability as well when we represent clients um, or, you know in front of the press uh, that's um, that's remarkable because that's actually how we met uh, with Azade. Just to let you know, to our viewers, we met on LinkedIn. I um, put across our channels on Woman on it. Hopefully, you are following us, our lovely viewers. We put your story across all our channels, and you reached out to us. And there was lots of people commenting from your network which was amazing boost for our uh, lovely small community. Thank you so much, Azade. So um, going back to the storytelling, uh, going back to how you found your startup. So you say that it's important to have your use case or your first client, as somebody who's going to be brand ambassador, friends, family and fools, whoever they are and are part of the uh, cheering network. Um, in terms of your services um, that you offer, you said that you can stipulate whether it's going to stick in the uh, Asian market or Australian or US market. What were the most compelling stories you could bring to us and tell us about the most successful startups from Australia that you helped reaching out uh, globally? Yes, yeah, so um, we could maybe shift it the other way around where we're looking at the global um, clients that we've helped locally. So that's pretty much the, a lot of the power that we, we operate is um, helping global clients like in the US that come to um, Australia or the APAC region and helping them grow. Um, so we've helped... Where do we start? Um, Amperity is a great example. Recently, um, they're an amazing identity resolution platform and working in the CDP space. Um, they came to uh, the APAC region. Nobody knew um, anything about Amperity, who they were. They had very, very little presence. Um, within one month, uh, we had over t uh, 20 media placements. Um, the local representative, who is a wonderful um, local um, influencer and leader in the marketing technology space, um, really cemented his leadership acumen as well in the in the region as a representative of um, Amperity. And um, you know, we've been really building their share of voice against their competitors to such an extent that within six months, they've now really, um, really exceeded um, uh, you know the, the space that they had anticipated. Uh, and and the and we're now representing them um, across you know, the UK and, and Europe. And um, you know this this sort of story that we have with our clients success uh, replicates uh, quite often. We had the same um, success with Sisense, which is a business intelligence platform, and um, Cheetah Digital as well, which is now part of CM Group, which is uh, rebranded to Marigold. Mm -hmm. So we we really. Um, that's really where where we sit. Where we'd love to see our clients that have had no, um, you know, no PR or very little PR activity in the past, really um, getting them accelerating their media presence and and getting their name in front of um, uh, the press. So, 
Um, again, like what with the, the business that we work in are very much in data analytics, business intelligence, MarTech, customer data platforms, CDP, CX and loyalty platforms. Um, there, there are a lot of the, the MarTech ecosystem, data, um, uh, AI, uh, they're, they're the kind of spaces that we work in um, quite extensively. You mentioned the change of name. Why was it important to change the name? Was it specific to that area um, for that startup or tell us about that? Yeah, so for, um, so just in, Cheetah, it, I guess they wouldn't be considered a startup anymore, but um, Cheetah Digital was acquired by CM Group. And um, given CM Group ha now um, has acquired quite a lot of different marketing technology solutions, they decided at top level to rebrand um, just to reflect their new um, ecosystem. So um, the, I, th I think that was definitely a decision made from the, the, the top group that now owns uh, the, the, um, the subsidiaries. Uh, now, talking about startup story, talking about names, how important is to choose the right name for your startup? So important. Given, <laughs> given the fact that in some areas, the name may, may be something quite yeah. opposite. Exactly. Um, yeah, so one thing that we've noticed that just don't do when you're creating a new name for your brand is something with an odd spelling. Um, you know, like if you're using the word connect and you put a, tr a, a triple N because what's going to happen is when you send that document with your brand name that's incorrect, you know, has an incorrect spelling, but it's your brand name and you send that to people, a lot of it gets auto-corrected into systems or the press when they upload it onto their CMS, it gets it corrected and you'll have to constantly issue editorial corrections or corrections to, to your prospects and partners. Oh, it's, it's not connect with, with a double N, it's actually triple N. And honestly, it's the most, it's the, the really waste of time and effort that you could do by just getting a normal word and incorrectly spelling it. So that's one thing to just absolutely avoid with the name. And also, yes, run it through translation, look at, look at what it means in different, um, different settings and scenarios. Sometimes things that have a bit of a symbolic meaning um, and the universal, universal quite would work or something with it has an ancient meaning. Um, Atlassian is a great example, which, um, you know, goes back to the, the Atlas um, that has that, that, really beautiful mythology resonance. You know, things like that are quite powerful. Um, great, Another great Australian um, startup is Canva. Again, it's just Canva, which is so easy to remember. It's not like a spelling error or something. It's just easy to remember and articulate. Um, so just keep it simple and avoid, you know, useless spelling things that are just – every PR person and marketer and journalist nightmare <laughs> to, to manage. Absolutely. Everybody loves Canva. We love Canva. And we mentioned Canva a couple of times, especially that it's a female founder. Now, Azadeh, one question. We've got beginning of 2023, we hear about job losses in tech industry. Why is it the time you, you claim the time is now for technology companies to consider expanding into new regions. Why? Well, uh, there's a lot of research that shows that the APAC region is strong, despite the fact that there's a lot of doom and gloom happening in the US and Europe and, um, you know, the UK with Brexit. Um my daughter has just created a lovely sculpture out of marshmallows. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. Bravo. Addition. That's creativity in action. Exactly. It looks like a Matisse. Um, it's just getting my train of thought. But the APAC region, is an, it's, got, it's its own little bubble. There's actually a lot of um, statistics that show that economically it's an area of growth and potential. So um, it's actually a very exciting time if you do want to take your uh, startup and start growing it into new regions to so consider the APAC region, Australia, um, New Zealand, Southeast Asia, Singapore, 
Um, you know, there's some really great hubs within the APAC region that are just thriving. Um, there's also, if you're in the e-commerce tech, um, in the sort of MarTech and CDP landscape as well, there's a big commerce um, trade uh, development, almost kind of like a commerce renaissance that's happening in the region that can attract those sorts of solutions as well. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting things happening that... Um, you know, we might get too caught up in the doom and gloom of what's happening in the US and, and the, the press and the buzz around those things to not see that there's opportunities on the other side of the fence. Opportunities on the other side of the fence. Uh, you mentioned a couple of um, uh, areas uh, for and types of business that can thrive. Now, going back to how to sell your captivating story to boost your startup exposure. Speaking about um, pitching to investors versus pitching to journalists and pitching to general public. Do you use different language or you have the same message all across different platforms? Or so, different yes, so the, core, the core narrative, your mission and vision and values um, you know, that your why, like I Simon Sinek says, start with your why. That why should resonate and be consistent across any form of communication you, you do, whether it's to prospects, press, investors. Uh, the, the, all of that content and all of that messaging and positioning that you will have as your startup, that will be available publicly uh, on digital channels, online, on your social channels. You want to make sure that baseline narrative about your brand is consistent. Um Sure, you can position it and angle it in different ways and bring in different narratives, um, different examples, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, but but that fund foundation and, and fundamentals should be consistent. Apologies, I'm on mute. It was just a cut this time around. He was building sandcastle. Luckily, he's not interrupting me and not showing me this on the screen. Now, as a day, here is a challenge for you. You need to sell and make sure that storytelling sells that sculpture that your daughter made. Inspire us today. <laughs> so what was the question, sorry? You need to do a pitch right now live and sell that sculpture with the storytelling in mind. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um let's have a think. Okay, this is you put me on the spot here. Is is your is your child um busy on their iPads? Are they struggling to keep focused? Well, have a think about the power of unlocking design thinking and creative thinking for your child. And what better way than to start with some sensory play, starting with some marshmallows. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo, Azadeh, that's fabulous. That Pitching, <laughs> absolutely. That reminds me the story of uh, in 2014, um, I decided with my husband to celebrate our honeymoon by doing a startup safari. And we went through uh, Europe and we landed in London at Google campus. And we saw competition with over 100 participants. So you can imagine how hectic it was how everybody was trying to impress and stand out from the crowd. That's more or less what it is to pitch your idea, your startup in front of potential partners, investors, or clients. Was it stressful, Azadeh? Uh, yeah, look, it, it wasn't stressful. It was fun, interesting. Um, I wasn't, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't quite ready to just do a, a, a random marshmallow pitch, but it was really fun. Um, but it's so true. Absolutely, Rita. I think it's, you know, you're, you're competing with all the noise out there and everyone like dogs to a bone to get noticed. Um, you know, you have to be prepared. You need to, um, you know, really deep, deep dive to find out what it is about your technology solution that is really different. Like what's your 
wow X factor point of difference that's just going to stand out within seconds. Um, and, you know, brand always helps having a really nice logo, eye-catching colors, um, your people that are genuinely passionate about your startup and can, and can and talk about it with, with the, the same passion as you have as a founder, you know, building your team that share the same vision for growth. There's a, there's a lot of moving parts to getting noticed and um, building that trust, credibility and thought leadership than just pitch being able to pitch right. There's a lot of um, subliminal messaging that goes on behind it that makes brands really resonate. And the more you practice, the better you get. Um, as we know, elevator pitch comes from the fact that you pitch. You have this chance meeting your potential investor in the elevator and you've got 30 seconds. Usually it's 30. You are in the US. Um, in Poland, for example, they extended it into three minutes. So sometimes it's getting very uh, tedious. Um, but that's your chance to pitch your idea and focus on your good storytelling. Azadeh, uh, coming back to the storytelling, what was the most compelling storytelling uh, you've heard in the last year or two? Yeah, so one of the very interesting stories that we uh, put together is actually a data-driven one. So um, during the pandemic, there were a lot of shifts in um, the appetite for data-driven decision-making, especially in the APAC region. So we actually pioneered the first um, data um, research report in partnership with Sysense, uh, which is a business intelligence platform. Um, we, uh, I think it was about 400 um, respondents, we asked about their appetite for uh, business intelligence, data analytics, how they're using AI, what are their challenges, really deep dived into all of the appetite for AI and BI in the region. Um, and we created a very compelling, very interesting research report which we then um, dovetailed into a PR campaign. It received significant media coverage. And uh, we also uh, ran a number of events and webinars off the back of it as well. Um, that was the largest report of its kind within the region, um, which uh, had significant reach. And it was also quoted and it impacted a lot of um, C-suite decision makers as well. And what was their story that was so compelling, apart from generating a lot of data? Yeah, so a lot of the story was um, uncovering um, the, the appetite for business intelligence and data analytics in the region. Um, and some of the, uncovered some of the main blockages of, ad, uh, of um, adoption. So really, some things that really resonated is some of the real... Um, internal structural problems and issues that organizations have in the region um, when it comes to adopting new technologies. Uh, one thing that really resonated as well from the report was the lack of C-suite buy-in um, for new technologies, which again um, was, was a problem that um, we, we've seen across the board. So you'll have an amazing piece of technology. The CIO is crying out for it saying we need it but then the CFO or the CRO or the CEO doesn't want to invest the money they don't see what the ROI is they're looking at it from a financial and commercial lens not from a um, technical you know um, architectural solution lens so there's a lot of those um, friction points that prevent adoption of innovative tools so those are the kind of things that uh, really was uncovered in the research with, which then uncovered a lot of very interesting talking points and discussions around these topics and you were there to help to uncover that uh, PR and marketing story um, for your client now thinking about um not everybody can reach out to you or not everybody can afford to reach out for a company with such magnitude as yourself. Um, how to find a local PR and marketing uh, agency and spot the buddies or spot the good ones uh, that are going to help startups? 
Yeah, so, um, you know, we, as an agency, we, we I would say, are very competitive um, in, our, in our pricing and very flexible in our structure. And like a lot of the, the large, um, larger global agencies um, that work on very, very big retainers, we're actually quite competitive. Um, we would position ourselves um, across between agency and consultancy. Uh, what we would suggest is if you are looking for a... Um, if you are looking for a really good media and marketing PR partner, have a look at who their client base is. Have they worked with similar clients in the past? Um, do they understand your customers? Um, ha have they really, do they have the use cases and proof points that show that they can really help you? Because no tech two technology um, PR specialists or PR agencies are the same. Um, there are some specialists that just work, for instance, in fintech or in consumer tech, where there are some agents that um, are more in the data analytics or um, or the martech space or B two B tech, and not so much consumer B two C tech. So really find um, PR specialists that have a proven track record within your specific area. Um, I'd, I'd say start with that. And then second of all, just uh, also have a look at, um, you, you know, that if you do want to do your due diligence, contact their previous um, clients and, and just have a chat with them. Um, a lot of the time the marketing and technology uh, ecosystem is so small that you can easily through word of mouth go, Hey, have you worked with these people in the past? So how were they really? What were they really like? Were they responsive? Did they give you, uh, you know, value? Did you get the ROI? You know, and, and just do do your homework before you you invest in um you know in a PR partner. What are the events or um, you know startup hubs worthy of? time of a startup that is based in Europe or US um, that need to come and need to pin down in their calendar in Australia right now? Oh gosh, that's, um, it's a little bit hard to say because there are so many different technology events um, across different verticals. I mean, you've got your online retailer and the retail events and you've got your um, CDAO, the Carinium events, uh, you know, the programmatic stuff. It just depends on what niche you're in because there are, there are, you know, you could spend every day going to an, to an event if you want. So, um, you know, it, it, it's sort of hard to answer unless you know which specific technology uh, vertical you're really in. I'm wondering because, you know, everybody knows about Tech Open Air in Berlin or Web Summit in, uh, in uh, Lisbon. So I'm wondering, is there equivalent in Australia that people need to know about? Uh, I wouldn't say there's like the one festival that everyone goes to. Uh, there, like I'll give you an example. Like Carinium, they run a CDAO event, which is a data analytics, but they they do a tour. So they'll have one in Brisbane, they'll have one in Melbourne, they'll have one in Sydney. They won't have one where everybody would go to. Um, you will get larger summits, like in the marketing technology space, like Adobe will do, will do a big um, will do a big uh, summit. Um, Salesforce, you know, with their Dreamforce, they have like a small local version of it. AWS and Gartner. Those are the big events that um, that resonate quite a lot with um, a lot of our clients. Um, Snowflake they run some pretty big events as well in the region. But again, it's it's hard to pinpoint that one big mega festival that draws mm. in every. Well, if there is a startup that wants to reach out um, to Azada, I highly recommend. Um, now speaking about um, compelling story uh, about how to get your message across. Other than, what is the number one niche everybody should look into in the startup world? The number one niche in how to frame your story or the number one niche in the technology platforms to in innovate? The, in the technology space that everybody should focus on now. Uh, you mentioned data as being yes. very data. highly regarded. Data. The big that big beast that's constantly churning the data. 
I, I, you know, the, if you're in the AI, I mean, you look at chat GBT and all of that space of how it's revolutionizing how we research and communicate. Um, if you can understand how to embed BI, data visualization tools, or anything that can help manage large volumes of data um, and understand data and make it manageable, for big organizations, there's a, there's a lot of potential there because we're, in, we're living in such a big data-centric ecosystem. Um, from that angle, it's a very exciting space to be in. Um, AI, the ethics around AI, so sustainable, um, sustainable and ethical forms of AI solutions, uh, that's also you know, getting a little bit of uh, that trendiness around it. Uh, with now that we've got the rise of e-commerce and retail and everything going omni-channel, there's so much potential, uh, you know, to to do any sort of customer acquisition type um, innovation. Then you're looking beyond all of those, which are more out, those are our specialties. But beyond those, if you're looking at agriculture tech, sports tech, wearables, IoT. Um, medical technology. I mean, the, there's so much incredible innovation happening uh, beyond, beyond you know, what, what we necessarily specialise in that are so incredible, that are really yeah. helping save lives and, and, and change, you know, could potentially change the planet for the better. I mean, having massive impact. Um, you know, th those sorts of technologies are, you know, incredible to be part of as a startup. Thank you, Azare, for brainstorming your ideas for the great uh, niches. I know this question is so uh, perverse. I actually was approached once uh, with a question of where is the niche I should focus on? Now, talking about ChatGBT, um, I actually found a funny meme recently. A little boy was asking for a uh, PR specialist and he doesn't need to pay, uh, he's, not, he's only offering $5 per hour because all the rest is going to be done by chat GBT. What's your take on that? Look, um, for full transparency, I haven't dabbled too much with testing chat GBT out and it's all its capabilities. Um, so for me, it's, I, I can't really, um, I, I don't know its full potential. Um, all I, I know that is you can, you know, to have, for, for you to have, be able to do what, I mean, for what we do, which is very niche and very specific to technology, there has to be that human layer and that contextual layer um, to anything that we communicate and articulate. So, yes, I, I, I don't know to what, ex, what kind of services he is offering and whether... Um, you know, or how far it's, it's going to go? Yeah, or I, I don't know. I mean, we'll have to we'll have to test him out. I might have to hire him on a project and see how well he does. <laughs> <laughs> Who so, knows what's going to happen? They probably are going to sit through some of your wording, and actually, you're going to boost their productivity. So you just be careful. Definitely, human factor is not replaceable in any AI. Um, path. Now, Azadek, we are heading towards the end of our story, and I'm mindful of uh, the time. Um, so, key tips to getting noticed by local prospects, if you could wrap it up in, let's say, five points. Uh, key tips. Okay. So, number one, like we, we said before, understand what are the local critical business problems and industry problems you solve. Now, then really think about um, your customers and your prospects' true pain points. What are those deep, critical pain points that you really solve? And how do you do it better than your competitors? And finally, um, you really identify um, what are those star qualities about your product that really make it exciting and resonate. Finally, make sure you have a local spokesperson, um, a local executive, a local customer champion, local brand ambassador, someone who is your 
real champion that um, can help articulate your stories and get that tr that human trust. Um, because at the end of the day, if, if you're looking at B2B technology, yes, it's business to business, but you will ultimately, you're buying from a human being. So you need to get those individuals, um, front runners talking about your um your technology solution in a very compelling and trustworthy way. As a, you're a role model for many females, and we know that females struggle with a lot of uncertainty and a lot of, you know, dealing with kids at home and uh, multitasking. Um, what is your advice to females who want to make a compelling story? and not be worried about how they come across and not be worried about all these stories about female leaders or female CEOs only get 2% of VC funding. It's, it's a real problem. And we're seeing a lot of um, female founders that we speak to have the same, the same issue. You know, there's, there's uh, we're hoping the narrative will change and um, we're starting to see a, a very slow shift um, but whatever you do, you, you bear in mind that we, as a society, we're going through a significant change. Um, you know, the technology shifts that are happening now have never happened in history. We're going through a massive historic change. Whatever we're doing as female founders, as female innovators, storytellers within technology, we are making history. The struggles that we are facing, we have to do it. We have to fight through. We have to break those ceilings because we're doing it for the next generation. And um, what, when, I, when, I, when um, I made the shift from journalism to starting an agency and, and you know, saw a lot of the, 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 the issues running a business, um, being, being female, and I'd walk into a boardroom, I'd be the only one there with dark, long hair, an unusual name. Everyone else would be, you know, uh, white, European or Anglo-Saxon, uh, middle-aged male, and I would feel like, oh gosh, I had to be. Do I have to make myself smaller? Do I have to make myself more masculine? Do, you know, like no, just own who you are, be who you are, be proud of it, um, be your authentic self, do what you do because you know you're good at it, and eventually your vibe attracts your tribe, and you just have to keep pursuing and persevering, and if people are, are not. Um, investing in you or are not hiring you because of their own prejudices, that's their loss. And you yeah. know what? Yeah. We'll eventually come round. Yep. It comes around for the next generation of girls making marshmallows, sculptures. You need to persevere and you need to showcase your story. Now, as of the None of us are able to achieve success without some help uh, along the way. Is there a particular person you're grateful towards? Is it your partner in crime in your company? Who is your husband? Yeah, or absolutely. Somebody else? Yeah, look, um, you know, I started the, the company. Um, I moved from journalism to um, running a PR agency. We grew very quickly. My husband was a um, technology and design educator. Um, and he gave up a 20-year career, um, a very successful career, to, to really bring uh, that extra support that's needed in the business from a commercial side, business operations side, to streamline uh, our business and help it grow and also create an environment where um, our, our business can thrive and um, that as a, as a PR consultant myself, I can be also the best um, I can be where he looks after a lot of the business operations. Um, and we have pulled through COVID. We have um, gone through thick and thin. Obviously, um, as a husband and wife, it's been challenging to know when the boundaries stop, you know, to create healthy boundaries for, and, and respect each other's um, roles. Um, and it's it's been a, you know, incredible uh, with a family as well, a young child, um, but uh, we have now realised after this is our sixth year of being in business, uh, we now have an office in the UK as well um, and capability on the ground, um, that what we have built is a very special, delicate ecosystem um, of our business and our family and our customers, our, um, 
uh, our partners, our staff, you know, our team. It's a very delicate ecosystem. It's not to be taken for granted and it's a real gift that we have created for ourselves that we should value and um, and and cherish because it's it's really our um, you know it's our future and it's setting up um, you know a, a lot of a, a lot of success for for those who are in on the journey. Just as I said at the beginning, uh, we are an inclusive forum of women in technology startups and female leaders who are supported by men as well. Other than going to the question about book. I wish I could read before I started my journey, my career. What is the number one book you want everybody to know about? Yes, so absolutely. Before you um, you know, go any further in your startup or your business or anything you're doing, read Clockwork by Michael Michalowicz. Um, it, is, it really helps you understand how to create streamlined systems for your business to prevent burnout, to create scalable business, uh, a way that you can work, that you can delegate and not have to be pulled in many different, different directions and still take a holiday. Um, the, one, of the, one of the mistakes that I made was I just threw myself right into the deep end and gave it everything and didn't know when to stop and I was burning the candle at both ends. I, you know, Within two years, I was very much burnt out. Um, and reading this book and also another good book is Ross Edgeley's um, an art of resilience to really help you understand what it takes to build resilience and lead. Um, these two books have helped me through some really tough times through COVID and all that uncertainty. Uh, and I wish I'd read those before, um, you know, before changing and switching from uh, journalism to PR. Can you please give us your life lesson quote and how did it change you? Yes, so I'm I'm really uh, passionate about literature and poetry. Um, I, it's it's part of my soul. Um, and one of my most um, loved quotes is, uh, "For a man's reach should extend his grasp, or what's a heaven for?" And it's um, a quote by Robert Browning from a poem called Andrea del Sarto. And for me, it's always about just striving for continuing to strive, continuing to learn, continuing to grow, um, pushing outside of your boundaries, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. So you're always extending and growing and challenging yourself. Um, and that's that's the way that I um, feel that's a really great um, philosophy to have in business and in life. Well, we pushed your boundaries today with the pitch for the marshmallow, definitely. And uh, you showed us the art of resilience, Adad Azadeh. There is lots of quotations here. Um, are you working on any exciting project right now? Well, um, you know, beyond uh, working on some amazing campaigns with our clients um, across, you know, multiple regions, um, as an agency, we love doing what we call our AZK Meets videos, where we do a walk and talk with quite successful founders and um uh, technology leaders and we um we we do them all around the world from london um paris um to sydney melbourne um you know and we're hoping we can get a few done in the, the united states this year or some other interesting exotic locations on top of that um, and it's just a wonderful way to engage with leaders and meet amazing people but also to celebrate some interesting stories in new and unconventional ways which we amplify on um, on our LinkedIn channels, both our company um, channels and personal pages. And uh, it's just a wonderful way to, to build that uh, technology storytelling. It's just a bit more of a quirky and human way. I watched some of it and I have to say, um, as a founder, I can uh, struggle with multitasking. Walking and talking um, is definitely your strength, uh, Azadeh. Uh, I really loved and enjoyed your way of interviewing uh, startup founders and hopefully you will make it to Turks and Caicos Island where we are heading next in our journey. Uh, it's not too far away from uh, Miami so um, since you're in the vicinity I hope we can meet there. Now um, we are close to the end of our live stream 
And uh, as uh, we like to quote Eleanor Roosevelt once says, women are like tea bags. We don't know our true strength until we are in hot water. In life, how are you in hot water? How are you brewing as a death? <laughs> like a good chocolate chai. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Chocolate chai, very, very intense uh, and delicious and aftertaste. Yes, that's right. And full of surprises. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, uh, imagine the pandemic and all the struggles and firing is over and you can pick any person in the world and have a private breakfast anywhere in the world. Who would you choose and where would you go to? Yeah, this, uh, this question I think is quite emotional for me because um, it's actually my grandmother's birthday um, this week and um, she's almost 100. So if there's one person that I would love to have a breakfast with just in her own little home, it would be my grandmother. She's one of the strongest, smartest women I know and she has always supported me every step of the way, whether it's my uh, career choices, personal choices, and she's always full of immense wisdom and she has that beautiful stoic element to her that um, just, uh, you know, just just adds that um, that little bit of spark and magic to, to my life. So it would have to be my grandmother. And she lives in? So she's, she lives in Tehran, in Iran. Yeah, so it's, it's impossible actually for me to ever visit um because of the circumstances in that in the country and of course she's way too old to travel to me so in an, in another universe in another time and space um we would have a little breakfast beautiful uh, thank you very much for that story azadel that's it um tell me a fact and i will learn tell me a truth and i'll believe but tell me a story and it will live in my heart forever as sabo said Azade, it was a true pleasure to host you today from the future. And that's it from episode 91 of the PhD live stream. To stay updated and ensure you never miss a positivity hack delivered, follow Women on It and turn on notifications to be alerted. As always, our positivity quote comes from positive thinking only and goes look for something positive in each day, even in some days you have to look harder. Resilience is the way to go for Azadeh and many startups who want to thrive in the startup world. Today is your day to hack the future, hack the positivity you want. Good luck. <laughs>